This is After Jackson, Cleveland's next mayor from IdeaStream Public Media. I'm Nick Castell. In less than two months, Justin Bibb will take the job he's been working all year to win. Between now and then, he has to name transition leaders, hire cabinet members, and figure out how he wants to run city government. He's met with Mayor Frank Jackson and spoken with city council members. The mayor-elect came by our studios early in the morning last Thursday to talk about the transition and to reflect on the campaign that carried him to City Hall. That campaign earned him a first place spot in the primary and a blowout victory in November. And that is where we started our conversation. Early in the race, um, I had a lot of one-on-one conversations with voters. And um, regardless if I was in my neighborhood of the Mount, Mount Pleasant or in West Park, there was just a desire for change. And if we could really tap into that desire uh, in terms of organizing people who shared that same sentiment um, and doing the hard work of just pounding the pavement, meeting voters where they were, um, I thought there was a lane for us. And I mean, well, it looking at the results, it wasn't just a lane, it was, yeah. or if it was a lane, it was a pretty wide one. Yeah, it was wide. And I think, you know, what we saw um, in 2020 with this pandemic, um, everyone kind of reassessed their own personal life outlook. And I think all the traditional political norms were just thrown out of the window. Um, and, and you kind of saw this in 2016, and in no way am I comparing myself to uh, Trump, but um, this desire for an outsider candidate. Um, and I started to see this in other cities across the country. You had uh, the current mayor of Richmond, Virginia, LeVar Stoney, never held elected office before uh, and, won, and won in Richmond in 2017. Uh, Randall Woodfin in Birmingham, Alabama, never held elected office before, won that mayor's seat uh, in 2017 as well. And then you had Frank Scott Jr., who became the first black mayor of Little Rock, Arkansas. Again, never held elected office and became mayor. And so... And they were all young too, young, right? Young black mayors, you know, leading, you know, uh, you know, really, you know, major American cities across the country. And, um, and there was a clear playbook, you know, organizing early, building name ID, building a broad-based coalition, um, really hitting home on um, kind of the key issues facing their respective cities. And um, that playbook turned out to be the right playbook to to win the seat here in Cleveland. Mm -hmm. Uh, You mentioned outsider candidates, and I know you've talked about sort of, uh, you know, well, people have portrayed you at least. I don't know what you think about that uh, label as the newcomer, the outsider. At the same time, uh, it looks like you built a lot of uh, connections with people who are established within Cleveland politics. I've been building relationships in Cleveland uh, since I was a junior in high school when I was in Look Up to Cleveland, right? Um, And... um, I've maintained those relationships for over 17 years. And so while I was a newcomer as a candidate for public office, I have not been a newcomer uh, to the city, uh, to our issues, uh, to uh, kind of relational organizing and um, how to build uh, coalitions. And, you know, I think that boded well for us in terms of my ability to bring people together in this campaign. So after the primary, Mm -hmm. Uh, when you're looking at the the map of of election results, yeah. Um, yeah. the biggest group of votes who were that were now uncommitted were on the east side. People yeah. had voted for candidates who had been knocked out. How did you make your inroads there? Because it, you were pretty successful yeah. in the end. I, um, I we spent a lot of time on the east side. I spent a lot of time door knocking myself on the east side. Spent a lot of time with clergy on the east side after the primary. Um, you know, I would be in three to four churches every Sunday uh, talking to various congregations. And then, you know, um, getting the endorsements of, of Councilman Zach Reed and State Senator Sandra Williams boded well for us. And I got to tell you this, uh, Zach Reed worked really, really, really hard uh, for our campaign. Um, and, you know, the fact that he, we were all able to put egos aside and really talk about the importance of you know, building back the east side as a key part of my messaging, uh, I think bode well for us in the home stretcher. Mm-hmm. Towards the end of this campaign, the uh, the Kelly campaign was really hitting the issue 24 yeah. very hard, yeah. Uh, yeah. portraying it as defunding the police. You know, we can 
debate that label, but that's the label they were using. Uh, do you think that that started to eat away at support that you had? Um, we were concerned about it, absolutely, uh, because in the primary, uh, we had made tremendous inroads on the west side um, and on the east side as well. And, you know, it's important, particularly with this issue of policing, that we had to get ahead of some of the attacks that we saw coming from the other camp. And um, and you started to see this play out nationally as well, where Democrats were starting to um, fight against one another in terms of who was going to be um, more, you know, progressive on talking about policing issues. And I think it was important for our campaign to really call out this notion of you can be for law enforcement and supporting law enforcement and also support police accountability. Uh, they are, you know, two different issues on the same coin. Uh, and it's important that we do both. And this rhetoric around defund the police was complete nonsense. Uh, it's the worst label in American political history. I said that in the Washington Post. Um, and um, I think when I was on doors talking to voters, they understood um, and I'm really happy we hit the pavement hard and got our, we were really proactive in getting our message out there. Mm -hmm. I think that gives us a point to look at talking about the transition here. Uh, yeah. one, of the, one of the things that you will have to accomplish now when you get into office is uh, seeing issue 24 through, mm -hmm. seeing how mm -hmm. you set this up. Um, one of the issues will be trying to talk to the safety forces about what this means for their jobs. Yeah. How are you going to have that conversation? Well, um, First thing I need to do is listen. Um, listen to um, the concerns and, and recommendations and, and perspectives from our leadership at the police union. Uh, listen to the concerns and, and ideas and thoughts from uh, our command staff. Uh, and listen to the concerns of, uh, you know, our, our patrol officers walking the beat. And um, I intend to, to fight hard to support our police officers, to give them the pay they deserve, to give them the equipment they need to do their job, uh, and my whole goal, my whole goal is to create a police department that my father would be proud of. Uh, and at the end of the day, that's a department that respects our residents, that fights crime, that's accountable. Um, and getting back to the old motto of uh, we, we, they are there to protect and serve, protect and serve. And that needs to be the mandate for the future. Have you given any thought to how to who you're going to put in charge of that effort? Is that mm -hmm. something you see the safety director doing? Is that a criteria for the police chief that they've got to help you implement this? How are you going to get it done? I, I think it's going to require a broad-based coalition uh, with my, my um, uh, police chief, my safety director. Um, I want the union to be a part of this conversation, police union, uh, and other uh, important community leaders, including leaders from the faith-based community as well. Um, I think it's important that we bring more voices around the table to get more community buy-in. Because I think that serves everybody well in the, in the long run. Mm -hmm. So looking bigger picture here, you've got two months, a little mm -hmm. less than that now, actually, yeah. to, to get this transition uh, rolling and, and to take office. What are the core decisions that you have to make right now uh, to, to lay the groundwork for that? Well, um, the first thing I need to do is identify a transition manager to help run the transition and a coalition of a transition co-chairs uh, from the community to support our effort. And then from there, uh, really working to uh, fill the top 10 slots in my administration. Everyone from the law director uh, to the police chief uh, to a chief operating officer. Um, and it's important that we get our core team in place uh, as we head towards early next year. But, you know, it's also going to be important for me as a, an incoming new chief executive to do the hard work of just taking stock. Uh, we want to be deliberate uh, move with urgency, but also uh, be um, prudent uh, to make sure we get our decisions right. Uh, you don't want to be too hasty when you're really trying to build a brand new government, uh, particularly coming out of this pandemic. Mm -hmm. On election night, you said uh, the results show that you have a mandate for change. Yeah. How does that go into your thinking when you're thinking about staffing? Because I imagine you want to have some new voices there, mm -hmm. but you need people with experience yeah. and know-how too. Yeah. Um, I'm going to have a cabinet that reflects folks that have worked in city government, um, but also folks that have maybe worked in the private sector, the nonprofit world, who understand the pain points that uh, many residents are going through right now. Uh, and so um, it's going to be critical that our cabinet is diverse, 
that has a diverse set of professional and life experiences. Um, and uh, I want to have a cabinet that is smart as heck uh, to uh, tackle some of these issues we have ahead of us. Yeah. Um, when do you think you might start announcing some of those hires? Uh, to be determined. Yeah. To be determined. Are you thinking that this is a, a national search for people? Do you want Cleveland, you know, people with connections to Northeast mm-hmm. Ohio? Listen, uh, there's an amazing wealth of talent that I can tap into right in our backyard. Uh, and I'm also going to look uh, nationally for some h- hires as well. I think a good combination of both would, would serve uh, the next administration pretty well. Mm-hmm. So what are the biggest issues that you think you're going to have to tackle right away? Number one, culture. Um, I, I talked about the importance before about taking stock of the organization, of the organizational health of City Hall. And um, I intend to do a lot of lunch and learns, uh, spending my mornings at the service garages, um, spending some mornings in the snow plows, talking to frontline City Hall employees, spending a morning picking up trash <laughs> uh, and figuring out what's going on with trash collection, um, and spending some time in the call center for the mayor's action line. Uh, so that I, as the chief executive, understand how do we put our residents first and really build a resident-centric approach to how we uh, serve our, our residents in terms of uh, procuring basic city services. And then once I take stock, uh, I intend to um, make sure that um, we have a common set of values that everyone could buy into, not just my cabinet, but that frontline employee that's picking up trash every week. We all need to have the same kind of values of how we show up and do our job every day inside City Hall. What, what values come to mind? The values that are important for me are, number one, transparency is critical. Um, number two, equity is critical. Uh, and three, um, moving with deliberate speed and deliberate urgency. Um, I think there, if there's anything I learned throughout this campaign is that voters are... Um, in dire need of seeing a more modern and responsive city government. So tackling those systems is going to you know, be a big hurdle for us, but we, we got to do it as soon as we can. Mm-hmm. You say tackling those systems. What, what, what systems inside City Hall do you think you need to get at? Uh, man, uh, everything from, um, you know, do current City Hall employees have the right technology they need to do their job? I was talking to uh, someone that worked in um, city planning, and they said, you know, in some departments, you know, they're using Microsoft 7, and in other departments, they're using Microsoft 10. That makes that means you can't share documents, right? Uh, during the pandemic, many employees didn't have laptops to work remotely. Um, most of our data, uh, I believe, inside City Hall is not in the cloud, so you can't access that data remotely if you're not at City Hall. And so just the basic aspects of, of kind of a 21st century enterprise we got to deploy inside city government to, to give our uh, employees the tools they need to do their jobs better. Mm-hmm. So I understand you've had at least a, a phone conversation with Mayor Frank Jackson. Yeah. Uh, could you tell me what was that like and, and what, what do you think your relationship with the yeah, outgoing um, mayor is going to be? Mayor Jackson was very gracious in uh, his phone call. He congratulated me on a well-fought victory uh, on Tuesday, um, getting some, some good counsel from him in terms of how to be, how to be mayor. Mm-hmm. Yeah, who are, you, who are you looking to? Who's advising you right now on, mm-hmm. on transition stuff? Um, well, uh, I have a good core team, uh, that served me well during the campaign, uh, that have spent some time in other mayoral transitions advising me. I've also have a good network of other mayors across the country that I get good counsel from uh, around, um, leading the transition. And then I've also had a lot of productive conversations with, uh, chief of staffs of other mayors across the country as well in terms of some of the best practices around leading a mayoral transition. So I understand. I think you you, you mentioned this uh, in an interview <clears> with <throat> WKYC. You've got to do some fundraising, too. I do. I do. Um, you know, we're going to need to raise some resources to support staff, uh, to support um, uh, various studies around um, how we build a, a city government for the future. Uh, and, uh, yeah, we're going to have to raise some capital in order to do that. Some studies. What do you want to? Are you going to look for what some sort of consulting studies or something? Looking well, at how to um, how to get in there. You know, I, I talked all throughout the campaign about doing a top down review of every department, uh, and then um, really doing a, you know a deep dive on uh, public safety. Uh, it's going to be critical, um, and so we we want to make sure we have all the resources we need to really build a a thoughtful, prudent, effective transition to give us a good uh, foundation going into uh, the new administration uh, in January. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What what questions do you want to ask in this process about public safety? Mm. 
One, um, I really want to understand from law enforcement kind of what they really need. What are their core pain points? What are their challenges? What does a good culture look like for them? Um, and then marry that with what we're hearing from the community and see where the, where the common alignment is. I also think, and, and I had this conversation with um, Jeff, Jeff Scott over at the Boys and Girls Club and Maisha Crow, who runs uh, the Peacemakers Alliance. You know, the, one of their frustrations is that we don't have a comprehensive uh, public safety plan in Cleveland. That's a major pain point. Uh, that's community oriented and bottom up. And that's something I intend to pursue uh, uh, next year in our first 100 days. Mm -hmm. Okay. So uh, public safety, one key priority. Mm -hmm. um, anything else that is that is really top of mind for you? Well, I talked about the importance of just having a modern and response to City Hall. So getting our city operations in place um, and, and getting some momentum there. Um, and then thirdly, um, making sure we can maximize the money we're getting for President Biden. You know, well, still to be determined to see how council and this mayor um, uh, come to terms on how to spend this first round of capital. Um, and, um, you know, if they don't spend the money, then I'll have I'll have all 512 to, to myself to spend. And uh, I've laid out a, a really, I think, smart set of priorities around how, how I would spend that money long term. Perfect transition to where I wanted to go next, actually. Uh, this ARPA money, the first half of it is here. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we are now at a point where it could be spent during this lame duck uh, yeah. session. Uh, should the city wait until there is a new mayor? Listen, um, we only have one mayor at a time. We only have one council at a time. So it's important that um, we, you know, allow the existing government to make decisions they want. And... Um, you know, I'll leave it up to them to make that call. But um, if the money is not spent, then uh, I intend to execute my vision as a new mayor. And what is your vision? Well, uh, I brought this up in the early days of this campaign when we found out we were going to get this money from President Biden that I wanted to create an office of economic recovery uh, that would work with our foundations and CDCs and uh, banking partners to find a way to leverage that capital and turn that $512 million to a couple of billion long term. Uh, but my four concrete priorities are around, number one, uh, direct neighborhood revitalization, particularly in the southeast side. Uh, number two, uh, public safety, uh, paying our cops more, making sure we fully fund violence interrupter programs at the neighborhood level. Three, truly investing in having a modern city hall, what I call city hall 2.0. And then four, uh, really, you know, s supporting investments around digital equity and, and lead paint to make sure we get some real change in those structural issues. Mm hmm. The lead paint issue is is a big one. Yeah. I mean, the city now has a lead safe law. It just yeah. has to make it work. Yeah. And it seems like one of the big issues is getting enough inspectors to actually go out and do that work. Uh, do you have any thoughts on how you can how you can turn the tide on that? Well, we have to, you know, really change the culture and the efficiency of our building and housing department uh, and beef up the cadence in terms of how to do their job. Uh, and then um, I intend to appoint a lead czar in my administration that will work across every single department uh, to make sure that City Hall, um, across every um, aspect of city government, is working to fight lead paint, the lead paint crisis, and supporting those respective community uh, organizations around that. Mm -hmm. So the organization of, of City Hall yeah. is, is one issue. You know, the health department right now is in the uh, underneath the mayor's office of, of you know, youth intervention, yeah. violence prevention. Yeah. Do you think that you need to reorganize? I'm going to have to revamp a lot of the org chart. Um, now, it's going to take some time to understand um, what moves are going to make sense. But um, as I look at it right now, there, there's going to be need, need to be a lot of change around that. Mm hmm. Um, any particular ideas for what, what kinds of changes are needed? Well, one thing I'm really keen on looking at is um, kind of this chief resident experience engagement um, kind of office or officer that really focuses on making sure that when you call City Hall that we track down your complaint and resolve your complaint, um, that you can access city data easily and that we have a resident-centric approach to how we design and procure city services. And that's something I get really excited about doing. Mm -hmm. um, what kind of relationship uh, do you 
would you say you have right now with the business community yeah. in Cleveland? Yeah. And, and what kind of relationship do you want to have as mayor? I'd say I have a, a really good, solid relationship with the business community. Um, and I intend to, you know, work with the business community to, um, you know, advance the economic recovery of our city coming out of this pandemic. Uh, there's some talent I intend to poach uh, from the business community for my administration as well, too. Um, but, um, you know, it's going to be productive. We all, we won't always agree on everything, but it'll be a productive relationship. Does that talent know you're you're looking to poach them? Probably not yet, but I'm coming. <laughs> I'm coming. Um, so, you know, one of the things that uh, is actually another unresolved issue at the moment is this progressive field mm -hmm. deal. Um, I, I know we've had some hearings yeah. on it. It's not it's not fully approved yet. Do you think that the city needs to take a second look at the terms of that deal? Well, the one thing I've been calling for is making sure we have strong community benefits agreements uh, in place tied to the progressive field deal. Uh, I want to see very clear, actionable targets around uh, minority uh, and women spend in terms of contracting and uh, folks working on the project. And then long term, you know, one thing I, I've talked to um, the Indians and others about, the Guardians rather, sorry, about is how do we, you know, think more broadly about these stadium deals as a lever of more community development? And you have good models with the Minnesota Vikings Stadium and what the Atlanta Falcons did where, you know, they really leveraged those investments to spur more community development. We need to see more of that in Cleveland when we look at these deals long term. Mm -hmm. And when you say community development, like what do you what do you have in mind? Well, so what the Haslam family is looking to do is beyond just, you know, uh, creating a new Brown Stadium or revamping Brown Stadium. They, were, they want to tie it to lakefront development, which supports and will help um, more residents beyond just folks that want to go to a Browns game and uh, really looking at the geographic area around Brown Stadium as a key part of the investment. Uh, there's some potential development opportunity uh, near Progressive Field that we can look at for bro you know broader community development. Um, and you know one small but I think powerful idea is that you know, if, if the city is going to spend money supporting these stadium deals, we should have a dedicated uh, loge or seats where community members who can't afford to go to games can come to games year round, um, where it's accessible to the public. Uh, and we need to see more of that in terms of us getting uh, more buy in from uh, these stadium projects. Mm -hmm. But I think long term, I think long term, we as a state, uh, have to have a broader conversation about how we fund these stadiums um, and you know because you know localities like Cleveland putting up taxpayer dollars I don't think it's going to be sustainable long term in my opinion mm -hmm. one other issue I wanted to ask you about was public transit mm -hmm. you uh, mayor doesn't directly run RTA yeah. but you get to make appointments to the board do. Uh, what do you want what priorities or values do you want those appointments to have yeah well um, I want to appoint folks who actually ride RTA, who are customers of RTA to provide real-time feedback on what's working and what's not working. Um, I'm looking to appoint board members who share my sense of um, urgency around getting our fair share from the state in terms of investments in public transit. And then long-term, we need to work with the G with GCP and other key stakeholders, including the leadership at RTA, around are there some alternative funding models we need to explore locally to support our transit um, uh, issues we have in the city. I know Toledo and Cincinnati have made some great strides around that. And so it's past time we look at some different funding models in Cleveland to really address our transit needs. Mm -hmm. The one that you've mentioned on the campaign was the smart parking mm -hmm. meters. Are there other uh, sources of revenue that maybe could bring in more money that you would want to look at? I'm not exactly sure yet. Um, but, um, you know, I think the smart parking meters is a novel idea although it may not solve the entire financial issues, it's a positive step in us being creative about some of these uh, public policy issues. Yeah. I think you referred to it before as sort of a, a low-hanging fruit thing that you could yeah. just get done to yeah. give people faith that government is working. Absolutely. What are some other things that you think the city can do right away that maybe aren't that hard that would make a change? Well, removing those jersey barriers out of public square. I want to do that as soon as I can. Um, protected bike lanes, having a robust bike lane network in Cleveland. Uh, traffic calming, particularly in you know um, black and brown neighborhoods in, in, in Cleveland, where we see a, a large number of pedestrian deaths. Um, you know, making sure that our um, uh, public spaces are 
well activated and programmed. You think about all the malls we have downtown, Mall A, B, and C, and you know, unless there's a major event, we don't really activate those assets well enough. Um, and things like that, where we can really leverage the, you know, the power of City Hall to invest in the built environment of the city long term. Mm-hmm. Is there anything else at this point I haven't asked about you think is really is really on your mind right no. now is really sort of, you know, something that's well, keeping you up I, right now? I, I, nothing keeping me up. I, I'd say it's important to reflect, take a little bit of time to reflect on this amazing, crazy campaign we experienced. And, you know, I said this in my victory speech on Tuesday that I think um, this mayor's race made our democracy better in Cleveland. It was a competitive campaign. Um, everyone made me a better man and a better candidate throughout the process. And so I want to just thank all the candidates again for uh, their valiant effort throughout throughout this campaign. And now we must all come together to um, make our city one of the best cities in the world. I'm actually glad you mentioned that because it reminded me I did want to ask about voter turnout. Mm. Uh, I know you worked really hard to get voters out and you got a lot of people out to vote for you. On the whole, it looks like the needle did not move that no. much in overall turnout. What do you think is going on there? It's a lo- This is a long-term systemic issue we have to address that won't be solved in one election cycle. Uh, and I'm going to continue to say this. The best thing I think we can do to increase voter turnout long-term is to prioritize talking to voters when it's not election season. Um, and so you're going to see me doing door knocking as mayor. Uh, you're going to see me having cabinet meetings in the neighborhoods. Uh, people have to fill the office to know why their vote really matters. And I think that's one thing we can do to increase voter turnout long term. This is After Jackson, Cleveland's next mayor from IdeaStream Public Media. This was our 18th and final episode. Thank you to our editors, Annie Wu and Mike McIntyre. Thank you to Drew Mazius, who composed our opening and closing themes. Thank you to all the journalists who contributed reporting. Thank you to our digital team for crunching listener numbers. Thank you to our marketing team for spreading the word about this podcast, especially Callie Andrus. Way back in January, Callie sent an email to our online office suggestion box saying, and I quote, a podcast or video series about the upcoming Cleveland mayoral and city council races, unquote. Never say suggestion boxes aren't worth it. But especially thank you, our listeners, and the voters of Cleveland. Before we go, we'd like to know what you thought of this project. What worked for you? What didn't work? What do you want us to cover in the future? Email me at ncastell, that's N-C-A-S-T-E-L-E, at ideastream.org. And if you like the work that we do, please consider supporting independent journalism here at IdeaStream Public Media. Go to ideastream.org slash donate. I'm Nick Castell. See you around.